Um, but it's a fantastic venue. It's so nice to be here, to see the water, the yachts, the mountain. Most of all, to see all of you. Um, really special. This is the inaugural uh, Systems Distributed. I'm the founder and CEO of Tiger Beetle. We're a very, very young company. You're not supposed to do a conference so soon. Uh, but we really love systems programming and we wanted to do this as soon as we possibly could. So we spun out Tiger Beetle in September and we already started planning this. Uh, so this was the quickest we could do it. And Feb is a great time to be in Cape Town. So thanks to all of you for coming out. Um, um, the goal for Systems Distributed, um, it started off, this is actually supposed to be a ZIG meetup. So Loris, who was speaking just now, is the, is the VP of community for ZIG Foundation. And about, about a year ago, I was in Milan in Italy for the very first uh, ZIG meetup in Europe. I got to meet Andrew Kelly, Loris there, um, uh, some of you as well were there. Um, and there had never been a, a meetup in Cape Town. So Loris said, well, why don't we just do a little meetup at the office? Um, so that's what we went and did, and it turned into this. Uh, so it's been a long time in the works. Um, but then also at the same time, um, what we saw was, uh, you know, we're doing systems programming with Tiger Beetle as a database. And a lot of people in the ZIG community are doing systems programming. Uh, but it seems that a lot of us are doing engineering in, in different places, maybe front end or back end. And systems is something we all aspire to, but we don't always get the chance to, to get into it. Um, so this was actually the angle for what we wanted to do in Cape Town all along, is to do something that will, it's not about ZIG, it's about systems programming. Uh, Zig could be just, you know, a language of instruction. Not, not that we'll be doing too much workshopping here, um, but the, the real aim of this was to make systems programming accessible. Um, and uh, Andrew, Andrew's talk is about that, and he's... Uh, okay, so this is Andrew. Is this your screen save, Andrew? Great. Oh, there we go. We got it. Um, uh, but this, this is the whole idea, and what was interesting was Loris is from Italy, and he was saying, look, you don't really have these systems conferences anymore, or that, you know, like Strange Loop has, has, is, is the last one this, this year, I think, um, and ScaleConf was awesome, uh, and, uh, you know, and others, but wh what, which conference do you go to to do, like, systems programming in an accessible way, you know, not necessarily just research. Uh, so that, this, this is the idea for systems distributed. Um, and then I was chatting with Amot from India, who's come all the way. Um, Amot was a CTO of Flipkart, uh, which is India's Amazon. And Amot was also sharing, well, he wanted to come because we've got such amazing um, cloud technologies, infrastructure, things have exploded the last few years. But that also means that as engineers, we sort of get left behind in our understanding. So, you know, how do you actually build these systems if they're built for us by the three or four cloud vendors? It's almost becoming lost. Uh, so what we wanted to do with systems distributed is, you know, in Cape Town, there's a lot of water. We'll just make a little splash and hopefully that splash can travel around the world be, become a little bit of a wave and and what we can see hopefully is that we we continue and um, you get this renewed interest in systems programming um, there was this time at toyota where they took the robots off the production line uh, what they found was if you have these amazing robots they do all the work but humans lose the understanding of how to actually build these systems. So this is the, the idea for systems distributed, that we can take the robots off the production line. You know, there's a lot of proprietary amazing stuff in cloud, um, but let's do that in open source and together let's talk about it. Um, and we also thought it's appropriate for Cape Town to be the place where we kick off systems distributed, uh, because this was the place where a lot of this infrastructure was born with Amazon's um, EC2, uh, so, yeah, some of us were in, in residence at UCT, you know, with, with some of the designers of, of some of the amazing Amazon infrastructure. So we thought, well, this Cape Town is perfect. Let's do it here. And with that in mind, I wanted to ask you, um, if you've traveled from Cape Town, um, anyone traveled from Cape Town? Pretty, pretty far to travel. Uh, would you mind to say systems? Systems. Okay. If you haven't come from Cape Town, if you've come from Alaska or Antarctica or wherever, could you say distributed? Okay. So we're ready. Okay. Let's do. So Cape Town. 
distributed it. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming, everybody. Um, yeah, and just great to see this finally come together. Looking forward to today. I woke up thinking, wow, there's a whole lineup of, lineup of talks, you know, tomorrow as well. So really excited um, to, to sit in with you. And with that, uh, let me introduce our first speaker. Um, so Barbara Liskov, the, the Turing Award winner from MIT, um, she had this saying, or she has this saying, that if you want to teach new ideas to engineers or programmers, you have to give them new programming languages to think in. You can't just teach them the ideas. You need to give them a new language to think in. And I thought that was really apt um, to introduce Andrew because he's done that for us for systems programming. He's given us a new language that brings back ideas from the 70s, almost forgotten ideas of how do you write software that is extremely memory efficient. You know, we've grown so comfortable to Moore's law, um, hardware becoming so fast, our software has, has become, it's almost at the breaking point. Um, and so there's this idea that, well, we can, w there's no reason we can't do it again. We've, we've gone to the moon before. Let's try and, and get that, pr that space program running again. Let's become more efficient with our software, with how we work with memory. Uh, but there's more to Zig than that. Zig is also um, a vision. Um, for perfect software. I mean, that sounds scary. You know, are, are, as engineers, are we allowed to talk of perfect software? Uh, I'll, I'll leave Andrew to answer that question. Um, but thirdly, beyond just a vision, Zig is also a foundation. And the mission of the foundation is to make systems programming accessible. And it's not even a language or a vision or a foundation, but it's a tool chain. Um, so, you know, use Zig to compile all your systems code, no matter what language. It's a really big systems vision. Uh, so it's a huge honor for me to introduce Andrew to you um, because he's had a tremendous impact on myself um, from since 2018. Um, and I hope that he will have an amazing impact on you. Uh, let's give it up for Andrew Kelly. Everybody can you hear me okay? Nice. Okay. Uh, let me just do some systems adjustments here. Aha. Uh -huh. We're good. Ah. Uh. It's great to be in Cape Town. Uh, I've never been south of the equator before, so this is my first time uh, seeing a different constellations in the sky and you know looking at that water that's around there. Uh, this is a really magical experience for me, so thank you for being here with me. Uh, oh, thank you, Loris, for getting my slides back up. Um, yes, my talk today is making systems programming accessible, and um, this silly little uh, gif from the uh, 80s will make sense eventually. Uh, so, about me, uh, you might think from looking at my very sunburnt face that uh, I'm turning into a crustacean, uh, but I assure you I'm still working on Zig. Uh, it's also my first time giving a non-technical presentation. I usually lean on technical details as a crutch, so bear with me. We're going to talk about some higher level ideas here. Um, yeah, and anyone, please come up and say hi later on. I, I'm a friendly guy. I, I would love to meet everybody and uh, just, yeah, pick some topic that you feel passionate about and strike up a conversation. Um, all right. So, uh, Systems Distributed Conference. Uh, what is systems programming? Do we have ideas about what it is in our head? Uh, is it when you're doing web scale? Is that what systems programming is? No, those, those web programmers aren't real system programmers, right? Oh, wrong. <laughs> software uh, systems programming is a way of modeling software development. So fundamentally, it's not about a category of what you're working on. It's a way of looking at the problem. So you have to model the problem that recognizes the bottom layer of the API. And then you think about the, uh, the function of the software in terms of transformations of the system using those APIs. And if you want to use frameworks or abstractions or whatever, you can. But to do systems programming, you have to know what they're doing to the system, to the underlying bottom layer of the API. That's my definition of systems programming. So that definition applies to uh, web development. You know, in this middle column here, we have the browser APIs. It, imply, it applies to servers or desktop or, or phones. Uh, and it applies to embedded development. 
So for example, uh, if we're dealing with a server, uh, we, we're going to have operating system calls. We're going to use read, write, uh, maybe some networking, some socket stuff. Uh, if we're in the browser, we have our, the, the, stand, the web standards that the browser provides, and that's the bottom layer. Um, and if we're doing embedded programming, we have the actual just physical capabilities of the hardware and the ABIs that are um, presented uh, via that interface. So I'm just saying that anything can be systems programming is if you look at it the right way. Uh, and I want to convince you that that's a, that's a nice way to look at the problem. So case study. What about just a simple copy utility? I'm just going to implement a file, uh, sorry, a, a program that just wants to copy a file from one place to another. Pretty simple, right? Let's look at it through a systems programming perspective. So we have to ask the question, well, what system is it supposed to run on? Um, so you know, depending on how you answer this question, it's going to uh, greatly impact how you write the code. So if you pick, for example, Linux, then our next step for designing the copy utility from a systems perspective would be finding out what is the set of syscalls the lowest API layer that Linux offers, and we want to use the best ones. So immediately, we might notice open, read, write. We could probably implement copy this way. But if we keep looking, we're going to note send file. We're going to note copy file range. Maybe we're even going to notice IOU ring. And if we're copying one file to another, the ideal, uh, the ideal thing would be just a syscall that is literally copy a file from one to the other. And then you've then you've communicated your intent precisely to the operating system, and therefore you have the best system utility on that system. So that's if that's if uh, that, that's our case study with a copy utility. How to look at just some, some simple program from a systems programming perspective. All right, what does it take to be an excellent systems programmer? Uh, does anyone want to raise their hand? Uh, it's an opinion question. You can't be wrong. Make, make mistakes? Any other ideas? You have a heap? Dive deep. I like it. That's going to be close to what my opinion is. Last one? Anyone? OK. Uh, here's, here's my opinion. Fully understand the systems involved. Maybe another way to say dive deep. Uh, so for starters, if you're writing browser code, you should know all the browser API that's available. You know, maybe you're using a framework or something that's fine, but you should know what API that framework has available to it to abstract for you if you want to do systems programming. If you're writing desktop application code, you should try to know every OS syscall. Um, you can just read the list and, and read what they do, and it really empowers your ability to understand what's possible on a desktop. Um, OK, I want to ask for a show of hands. Has anyone ever dealt with a code base at work that was considered untouchable? So maybe it was some legacy code. We got one here. <laughs> uh, even though you're, uh, I see a bunch of hands, yeah. So if, even though your application depends on it, it's a core software, no one really wants to go edit the code. It's kind of read only in a way. Uh, yeah, OK, I've seen people familiar with this, with this, uh, this concept. Yeah, um, when I worked at uh, OkCupid, we had this library called um, libsfs, and this was written before the dawn of time. I mean, and by the dawn of time, I mean C++ 17, of course. Uh, <laughs> and this library, it had, it, had interest, it had an interesting set of uh, utilities in it. It had some broken crypto in it uh, that the website used. Um, it had some silly strings API. And everyone hated it. No one wanted to use this library, but no one wanted to go edit it. It seemed untouchable. Uh, and I think that this is a limitation of not understanding the system. So there was an abstraction level that the engineers, that my, my coworkers, uh, were, were unwilling to go beneath and understand the systems that were being talked to. And that caused the situation where we had the software that could not be updated or, or maintained or deleted even because it wasn't unclear how to uh, you know, connect the dots after, you'd, after you remove that. Um, yeah, that's that example. So let's, uh, let's pivot a little bit here. Uh, okay, accessibility is kind of the key word here. What, what makes something accessible? What, do, what are we thinking about? Image captioning, wheelchair ramps, 
annotating pictures with semantic information. I think that making things uh, usable for more people is, is a very valuable proposition. But I think it's even more than that. I think that when you, when you make something accessible, you're increasing the amount of different use cases that are possible to interact with that, with that system. And so, it, I mean, it works in the real world. Um, if, we add a, um, if we add semantic annotations to help with screen readers, we're also increasing searchability we're also increasing training data for learning models. If we add uh, a, a ramp to access a building, uh, we're helping um, not only more people be able to get inside, but we can even do other use cases we never thought of, like uh, I don't know, hosting an arcade game tournament inside a, uh, inside a local bar. Um, so point being that uh, accessibility is, is, is not only just helping people who need help, it's, it's much more than that. It's about increasing the um, usefulness and the amount of use cases that can can be provided by by a system. Um, so connecting this back into into tech, uh, if we talk about system accessibility, I, I, I'm going to define this in a very short way as just anything that helps people towards a more complete understanding of a system. Uh, so that could be a very broad topic, and I think that that's all important and it's all part of this definition. Um, also note that technically two systems interacting is itself a system. Um, accessibility is how you get good at programming. It's, it's the thing that you do that just levels you up. Uh, I mean, if you think about, uh, think about some colleagues that you have, and you can probably, I mean, keep it to yourself, but you could probably rank them in your mind about which ones are more capable and which ones aren't. And there's a pattern that I noticed, and sometimes you think that, it's the person with more years of experience that is the more capable. Uh, but I found that it's actually just the person who's willing to dive deep the most and learn the most about the system that they're working with who actually ends up being the more capable person. And oftentimes, the, the, years, of, um, uh, the, the years that they've been doing the work is actually just correlated with the fact that they've had to learn more about the systems on accident. But you could do it on purpose. You, could, you, can, you can learn everything about the system on purpose, and then you can write excellent software. Uh, and so that's what I want to convince you of today, is a way to think about how we can build better software uh, by thinking about it from a making it more accessible perspective. So let's say we have a black box. This is an analogy with, uh, with your system. And at first, you can't even see the box. Testing is what lets you see the shape the size and just observe its behavior. Uh, simulation is like making the walls transparent so you can at least look inside and maybe try to figure out what it's doing inside of it. And debugging is, is voiding the warranty, taking it apart, and starting to tinker with changing it and seeing how these changes can, uh, can change its behavior. And I think that all three of these are uh, some great first steps towards assess uh, accessibility. So unit testing, for example, uh, I have some just some zig code I, I threw up on the screen here. Uh, I think it's um, it's nice that you can put some unit tests next to your functions because a lot of times accessibility is about reducing the barrier to entry. So we all could do unit testing in any language under the sun, but if it's easier to do unit testing, then more people will do it and it, more accessibility will happen in practice. Uh, so that's one kind of testing, unit testing. Um, there's also uh, fuzz testing, where uh, there's a cool thing you can do with a compiler where the compiler instruments the code and it helps interact with the fuzz tester to tell the fuzz tester uh, whether it was able to find all of the branches in the code and help it uh, find use cases that are more um, helpful for, for finding bugs. So that's another uh, nice part of, uh, of testing. Um, as for uh, as for simulation, uh, I'm going to just foreshadow a little thing here. Has anyone heard of view stamp replication made famous in this room, perhaps? Hmm, yeah, OK. Um, I'm going to have to, uh, I was going to show you a little clip of something. Um, wait, no, sorry, this is a different one. This is another great way of testing. Tiger Beetle uses, uh, uses a deterministic uh, state machine that models abstractly the system so that the testing can be done more effectively. And, and, and thinking of the black box here, this really helps to limit 
the, the extent of what is possible. So you know that the black box only works a certain way or doesn't work a certain way. It helps you grasp the system more. So I think this is a great example. Um, there's another thing coming up, which we'll, we'll get into as well. Um, that's testing. So let's move on to simulation. Uh, I make simulation a separate section than testing because I want to highlight that uh, sim even simulation that only visualizes things is incredibly valuable of itself. Even if you, if you have a simulation, and even if it doesn't identify issues, it still it gives you the mental model that you need so that you know the issues just in your mind. Yeah, your, your model will just pick them out for you. Um, OK, yeah, this is where I have to just foreshadow. I wanted to show a little clip of something, but I've been informed that we're going to see that later. Uh, so we'll come back to this tomorrow. Um, but I, I also want to share another story about a, a project that I was working on um, before I started Zig. Uh, I was working on a digital audio workstation. And I was doing this in C++. And I coded the, the, the core pipeline. So you have, the, uh, you have effects, and you have instruments. And they all can kind of be you know, wired together. And at the end, the music comes out. And it's very complicated to implement an audio pipeline because it has to be real time. It has to go fast, and, uh, and there's multiple threads running, and the things are waiting on each other. And I did not make this system accessible. I just tried to code it right and just, just guess what was going to happen. And when there were bugs, I couldn't fix them because I didn't know what was going on. And I didn't know this at the time, but now, as I've gotten older in my career, now I know what I needed to do. I needed to code up a simulation. I needed some visualization. I needed more introspection. I needed a way to understand what is happening so that debugging wasn't an all-day affair where I was using command line tools, but debugging could look like just looking at an animated a uh, graphic of, of what's happening and just spotting the obvious problem and then fixing it immediately. When you have the right simulation, that's what you can do. When your system is accessible, bugs are trivial. So here's some tools that you can use for simulation. If you have uh, code that wants to run on a different architecture than the computer that you have, uh, we have Kimu. Kimu is an amazing project. It can simulate not only uh, user land uh, different architectures, but it can simulate entire systems. You can, you can simulate uh, an arcade game that you want to run on a Raspberry Pi before you ever try to boot it on real hardware. Um, so that's, this is a great example of an existing tool that you can use to make a system accessible. Uh, we have this project, uh, LLVM Machine Code Analyzer. Uh, this is a bit of an advanced compiler use case, but it's, again, a simulator. It simulates a CPU. And it can be used by compilers to understand uh, what would these machine code instructions do on a computer. And being able to understand this is uh, invaluable for uh, engineers who want to write optimizing compiler passes. Um, OK, this is the one that I have to foreshadow. Don't look at this part yet. We'll see that, we'll see that later. <laughs> and then, uh, oh yeah, sorry, I'm trying to build up to this one. OK. so. If we had just hypothetically, you know, uh, a deterministic hypervisor at the OS level that could simulate, uh, you know, different kinds of thread uh, operations or different kinds of syscalls giving you the wrong answer or the right answer at different times, uh, that would be an incredibly useful tool for making your system accessible if we had that hypothetically. Uh, so let's move on to uh, debugging. Uh, I wanted to talk about. Uh, I wanted to highlight some of the differences between command line debugging and uh, these like UI debugging tools. Um, so, and remember with the black box analogy, so simulation is like we're looking inside the black box, it's transparent now, and debugging is, okay, now we're opening it up, now we're tinkering with it, we're trying to actually change its behavior. Um, so debuggers are incredible tools for making systems accessible. Um, I mean, if you, I think probably most people have used a debugger, but I know that people prefer printf debugging. Wait, okay, we gotta do the hands on this one. Okay, who's the printf debuggers? Ah, well, I can't believe you are, that's crazy. Uh, okay, and who's the debugger developers? Okay, it's like a little more debuggers, but uh, quite a few printf debuggers. Nothing wrong with printf debugging, that's a way to make your system accessible, but so is debugging. Uh, <laughs> So for the printf debuggers in the room, uh, here's what actual debugging gives you. 
<laughs> you can pause your program at any point in time, and it's paused, and then you can just go look at any variable, any state in memory, anything. You can just understand what, what it's doing. If you have a, a, a deadlock, you can just tell every thread to drop you a stack trace, and then you can figure out, okay, why is there a deadlock? Uh, so debuggers are incredible. They, they, it, they just give you a picture of where your program is at a certain time, and then they let you like slowly move forward and see how it changes. Um, yeah, so there's command line debuggers like GDB. There's, uh, uh, and I, here I'm trying to highlight the difference between uh, desktop and, uh, and, and browser again a little bit. But anyway, point being, uh, I, I think that GUI debuggers are m more, th th they're giving you more accessibility bang for your buck. I mean, because you're getting, like, the visualization component of it is extremely helpful. You can click in the gutter to make a breakpoint. Um, you can, uh, you, you have your code in line and, and you see the little you know, yellow highlighted line and that's all, it's faster. It's giving you more insight more quickly. So I think generally, I would argue that UI debuggers are more effective, but command line debuggers like GDB, they do offer some more advanced use cases. And that's still valuable. So for basic debugging, I'd rather use the, the UI based one, but for some advanced use cases, you can access more complicated uh, you know, um, cross sections of your system uh, with, with these more advanced tools. Um, yeah, moving on, uh, I'll give you another little, uh, a little Zig example. Uh, so in Zig, we have these stack traces that are on by default. So if you get a, uh, if you get a crash or, or error that goes to the top or something like this, this is the output that you get. And this is another case where I'm, I, I want to point out that in theory, you could do this for any language, any time. You can crack open your debugger, uh, you can set things up, you could put print statements everywhere. Um, but having stack traces that pop up by default automatically, it, makes, it reduces the barrier to entry. And with the same amount of time that you have, you're gonna get more, uh, you're gonna get more out of it. So you know, maybe I make a change and actually, oh, crap, you know, a crash happens in my coworker's code. I don't want to debug my coworker's code right now. I'm working on my thing. Maybe you would have just, you know, filed a bug and, and put that off. But wait a minute. Oh, there's a stack trace here. Oh, it's just a null reference. Oh, I see what the fix is. Oh, I can just keep working. You know, if, if you reduce the barrier to entry, then the system becomes more accessible. All right, so next we have, uh, we have some tools like uh, tracing. And I wanted to show you a quick, a quick little video here. Um, that's not the right one. There we go. This is just going to be about 20 seconds. Um, not going to play audio for you, but this is, this is the author of Tracy demoing, uh, oh, that's not what I, oh yeah, that's good. This is the author of Tracy demoing it, and I don't want to overwhelm you with what it does, but let me just kind of give you the picture. You, you run your code instrumented with this, this program, and it gives you a timeline of, of everything that's happening during your, this specific run. And if you're ever curious about the performance of it, you can really drill down deep. Oh, there's a good example. Um, and I, I don't wanna go into details, but what I wanna show you is that this tool takes you from looking at glyphs in a terminal and just kind of having a foggy mental model of, uh, of what's going on, it takes, you, it takes you from that to having a very accurate, intuitive grasp of what's happening through the entire duration of your program. So even if you open this up and you don't even make any changes to your code and you don't even find any performance improvements whatsoever, even just looking at this makes you a better programmer because you understand your, your uh, the behavior, the model of the system. Okay, that's uh, that's all I want to show on that. Nice. Uh, next up, uh, quickly, I wanted to mention Valgrind. Valgrind is another great tool for accessibility. Uh, Valgrind is a tool. Uh, does anyone use Valgrind? Okay, oh, I'm talking to experts here. Okay, great. Uh, for those who haven't used it, Valgrind is incredible. It decompiles your code adds instrumentation to it, and then recompiles it, runs it again, and then now it's able to tell you a bunch of useful information, like 
did I do undefined behavior? Did I have a memory leak? Uh, and there's also other tools that can help you with uh, performance things. Um, so that's a great tool. If you haven't played with Valgrind and you do uh, C or C++ or other languages like that, I, that's the one takeaway you should get from this talk is just try Valgrind. Uh, and then finally, uh, for debugging, I wanted to point out, this isn't even a tool. This is just performance. But short edit compile test cycles is actually an accessibility tool because you only have uh, a, a certain amount of time to work. I mean, if you're only working 40 hours a week, there you go. Uh, maybe you work more, but you're going to, or, or less, and that, that's your limit. So, um, you, you know, or it's your side project you're doing on the weekend. It doesn't matter. Point is that you have a limited amount of time. So if you have shorter cycles, you're going to make more progress. You're going to have more intuition about how the software works, and uh, it's going to work better for you. I mean, this is a pretty obvious point. Um, but I wanted to point out that uh, this is one of our uh, biggest priorities in Zig specifically, um, and we're not there yet. But uh, I'm, I'm very excited to. Um, I think we can push the state of the art forward on on this particular point. So that's that's something to look out for. Um, okay, we're almost there. Um, I wanted to I wanted to share a story uh, about an old coworker of mine, uh, and I know. Uh, I don't know if Alan will ever watch this talk, but I, he's, he's a cool guy. I'm sure he'd be fine uh, with me mentioning his name. So if you're there, Alan, hi. Uh, you're a super cool coworker, but I'm going to tell a story about us now. Um, when we worked at this, uh, this startup for, um, for sharing music, we kind of butted heads a little bit. Because, uh, okay, this is fine. I'm just telling a story. Yeah, yeah. Do you want me to not record? Um, uh, tell a joke. Tell a joke. <laughs> so you promise you'll laugh. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to uh, double check the uh, recording? Yeah. Is it okay? Okay. Okay, I think we're all good. Uh, yeah, so I want to share this story. We kind of butted heads a little bit. And, uh, you know, we got along, but we also didn't see things the same way. So the, the, the difference in, in vision was that he really liked to use shell scripts and existing tools um, on, the, on the production machine to get things done. So for example, uh, maybe the task is to upload something to S3. He would want to use a command line tool to do that. Whereas I wanted, uh, I wanted a tidy application that had a function in our actual programming language that would do it. So it was a Node.js shop. So I wanted, I wanted a Node module that did S3 uploading so that I can, you know, I can handle the errors and all these things. So that was, our, that was our kind of different way of looking at it. And I've, I've, over the years, I've, I've sort of come to appreciate his perspective a little bit more. Um, while I still have my preference, I can now see how his strategy at a startup where you have to move fast, uh, it, it, allowed, it, it used existing tools that had their own, uh, uh, their own accessibility tooling in them. So for example, if I, if I wrote some node code to do the S3 upload, and there was some kind of problem with it, it might be tricky to debug. You know, maybe there's a lot of functions and there's a lot of code, and it's hard to find the bug in it, and there's no tooling to help me figure it out, you know, other than the standard tooling like debuggers. But there's no application-specific tooling. Meanwhile, with my coworker's strategy of, of shell scripts, yes, it's janky, and the errors aren't propagated properly, there's a lot of problems. But it did have the upside that you could use the standard Linux tooling to observe the state of the system. So you could get inside the box and you could look around. You could look at the process tree and see the S3 uploading uh, process and what it was doing and how much memory it was using and that sort of thing. And so while I still would criticize that technique in the sense that it's, uh, there's just too many moving parts that you don't, are, you know, it's a more complicated system. So I don't like that about it, but I have to compliment the fact that he found a way to gain uh, accessibility tooling for free by breaking up the problem into multiple different different parts. So I just wanted to look at that that story through this lens. Um, and so I kind of hinted at this, but uh, so final thoughts is we're always creating new systems whenever we write software. So in my example with the uh, with the audio um, synthesis uh, software. I was creating a system for real-time audio processing, and uh, existing existing systems 
have tooling to make them accessible already, which we can and should take advantage, uh, take advantage of. But when we create new systems, they don't come with accessibility tooling. And so my, my takeaway is uh, maybe we should invest in creating those new domain-specific accessibility tools when we create new systems. Uh, so learn your systems, learn your tools, and uh, go forth and make great software. That's, that's my talk. Um, I'll, 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 sorry, I'll, I, I know I made you clap. One sec. <laughs> Let me summarize. Uh, uh, summarize, then we can clap. Systems programming is a way to model software development. Great software is built when the programmers have an accurate and complete model of the systems involved. Well-established systems have already been made accessible to us via standard tooling. And the new systems we create are not accessible until we additionally invest in tooling specifically designed for that purpose. That, okay, that's my talk. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Um, are there any questions? Uh, this is totally impromptu. Did we agree to do questions after the talk? No problem. No problem. Okay. Take it away. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, Hello? <laughs> Who is it? Is it working now? Oh, yes. Um, so uh, in terms of compilers and opinionated compilers, um, what, what's your opinion of something like Rust um, that really guides you to correctness and how that applies to productivity? Uh, so the question, is, oh, oh, you have the mic, so I don't have to repeat. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think that there's an interesting um, disconnection in a lot of the discourse uh, with regards to Rust and uh, other programming languages that have a different uh, memory safety model out there, uh, particularly with Zig. Um, I, I would say that Zig focuses more on correctness of software, and Rust fo focuses more on memory safety. And to me, memory safety is just uh, one of the many facets of software correctness. Um, you can have some pretty garbage uh, memory safe uh, software, um, and you can actually have some pretty good high quality you know, software that maybe has a, a memory safety bug somewhere in a, in a harmless location. So. I, I think that uh, I actually would disagree with the categorization of, of Rust as the, the king of the correctness uh, uh, language uh, playground. Thank you. <laughs> What'd you say? I took the bait. Yeah, I did. Go ahead. You can bait me all day. I'll, I'll say spicy stuff. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Andrew, I just want to comment maybe on, you think of languages like Node.js, you mentioned it, where like the initial developer experience is quick, but the debugging and stuff and tooling around it is really shit. Um, how do you deal with that sort of disconnect where sometimes people find the path of least resistance to get started is really easy, um, and then they just sort of go ahead with that system, keep developing it, um, and sort of get into like a hole and then like, oh, well, we've invested all this energy into it. Let's not do anything. Um, Cause that's sort of common in a whole lot of other things. I mean, C++ is, gives a lot of those same foot guns. Um, yeah, just maybe your thoughts on that and, and how you can mitigate that in the future. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I actually hadn't thought about that. Uh, I hadn't thought about this topic through that lens, uh, but I want to point out that, um, yeah, there are some issues with Node.js tooling, but it also has pretty good tooling, like the Chrome DevTools or Firefox DevTools I mentioned. You can actually integrate with Node and, and get a proper debugger going, um, which is very nice. Um, but other than that, uh, it, it's interesting. I, it, I think that you have to try to strike a balance when you're creating a system of uh, so, sometimes there's a, a, a competing, uh, two competing factors. And one is accessibility, and the other is uh, maybe running that running that system at maximum optimality on the hardware. Uh, so as an example, 
um, if we run, if we use Lisp or other or Java or another virtual machine, the fact that we have a virtual machine actually gives us a nice little platform where we can uh, create accessibility tools. We can observe, um, you know, the stack traces and the RAM usage, and I don't know, we could even just add a whole bunch more uh, introspection into the VM, and it'll uh, we'll be able to use that, and that's that's nice. But then you've introduced this layer between the VM and the hardware, which is not maximally efficient. Um, so yeah, it kind of sounds like you're teasing at that that um, trade-off, and that's something I think a lot about. Yeah, specifically with Zig, uh, one of the approaches we've tried to take is is having it kind of both ways in a sense. So for example, uh, with Zig we have uh, safety checks and these safety checks are on in uh, some build modes and often others. So depending on your application domain, you can choose which ones you want. So when you're debugging, obviously you want the program to crash as soon as possible. Um, and then depending on your application, when you release, maybe you actually want to turn those off. Maybe you're fully confident in your tests and they're all good. Um, or maybe you want to actually keep them all on just in case. And actually, I want to ask Yoran, do you uh, publish your release builds with which one? I'm going to give the answer tomorrow. Are you? But, but oh. we, we speak to it, so that's, that's the, great. That's the second time I almost spoiled your talk. Yeah, thanks, okay. Andrew. <laughs> uh, do you feel the answer was satisfactory? OK. Hi. Oh, Mike. Um, hi. Mine is more of a statement than a question. So I suppose my question is, what do you What's your opinion of my statement? <laughs> so when you were discussing what makes a great developer, um, and you specifically mentioned it not being years or how long you've been in the industry or how old you are, but how deep you dive and how well you know your system, I completely agree with that. But I wanted to add a point of, um, I think great developers are also made when you are willing to ask for help. Ooh. And I think, um, I don't think that that's mentioned often enough, so I just wanted to raise it. Well, I, I completely agree with you, uh, if you want my opinion. And I, I think that that's something I should have included in the talk, uh, which is that another way a system could be accessible is if you just have a human uh, who can explain it to you. <laughs> it's a very uh, a handy interface sometimes uh, to the inner workings of a system. <laughs> so I, yeah, I unilaterally agree. Yeah, thanks. I'm so glad we did questions. We got one more. Oh, one more? Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, I think a lot of developers probably aren't classified as systems developers, and they don't necessarily dive like beyond the abstraction of the programming language they live with, like JavaScript or whatever, every day. Like, Do you think there's still good lessons for every software developer to take out of this talk? I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't expect every single software developer to need to understand OS level commands to write good software, right? Like, um, if you have a small scale app and you just need to get your business logic right, there's what sort of lessons do you suggest they take away from there? Mm, yeah, yeah, that's a fair question. Um, I would say that, uh, yeah, so I'm trying to um, I'm trying to present systems programming as a way of looking at software that can be useful. Uh, but yeah, maybe it's not always uh, the right trade-off. You know, uh, maybe you don't need to look at maybe a problem just doesn't require a systems programming perspective. Maybe that wouldn't actually be too valuable. Um, I think a good example would be games. Um, there's kind of two sides to the story about that. So on one side, uh, who cares about the system with a game? Like you just care about the experience. Uh, a, a games can just be played it, with objects in real life. We don't need systems, you know. Uh, so, it, it, at some point, it, it doesn't matter. You know, it's not the right way to look at it. But on the other hand, um, sometimes with games, the, the things that you want to accomplish are uh, only possible to accomplish if you actually exploit the hardware enough. And if you don't, you can't you can't do 3D or you can't do whatever. So in that, and once you start to look at it that way, well, then you do need to kind of put your systems developer hat on to be able to make the game that you want to make. That would be kind of how I would look at it.
But I, 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 I agree with your point that there are certain problems where you don't need to dive that deep and you can still solve the problem and it's fine. Yeah? Uh -huh. Yeah, so I just wanted to add to this. Uh, so I come from India, uh, and um, I think there's definitely value to what you talked about and you know what uh, you just talked about in terms of just getting the problem solved. But over time, what happens is, uh, and this is what I've seen in practice, that for every software, the long-term effect of that software involves the way we've thought about resiliency of that software or the instrumentation of that software. And it shows up as, as very hidden cost for that company. And one of the, that's one of the big reasons why I personally encourage every, every developer, every engineer to understand the systems. Um, because at least in India, the average time that an engineer spends in a company is a couple of years, and after that, they move on to a different problem. Uh, so the, the cost is borne by somebody else. And what that leads to is that this understanding of the, these hidden costs goes, just continues without really anything changing in a very material way. So uh, I just feel that it's something to think about. Uh, that it's absolutely worthwhile for every developer to uh, understand these systems and for companies to invest in making sure that their engineers are thoughtful about the long-termness of their software. Thanks, thanks everybody for the amazing questions. It's just elevated things to a whole new level. And thanks to Andrew for awesome talk.